March Madness reaches its crescendo this weekend for both Purdue and for Iowa. And Ken Davis and James Navo are here to, I just talked about myself in the third person. I don't care. We are here to break down both of those games coming up this weekend. Iowa going to be taking on UConn in the women's final four. And you've got Purdue taking on the upstart NC State Wolfpack in the men's final four. Ken, it's kind of like if, if this feels like it did when we got into the college football playoff, when we were like, all right, Michigan's entire season has literally led to this. I think you can say that for both Purdue and Iowa, that they expected to be here. And now this is where the rubber meets the road and where we really find out what these teams are made of. And it's ironic that, you know, you say that when there's only four teams left out of 64, but that's where we're at, man. And I am super fired up. Both of these games cannot wait to break both of them down. Ken can't wait for you to break them down either, James, as I go third person with you. Or as I bring out old references, Ricky going to be Ricky, referring to great steals leader, Ricky Henderson, former NLB and Hall of Famer. Mm. Um, Listen, I think that was great when you said the Michigan part, because you can put that on both teams, but really on the men's side, it hits harder when you're talking about. The, the expectations of what Jim Harbaugh had to do before leaving Michigan and the expectations of what we want Zach Eady to do before he leaves Purdue. Um, and it, it stumbles that they had in that this prior seasons where it was like, oh, I thought you was him. And then it was like, ah, you're not him. How people mm-hmm. not, we didn't say that, but that's how people reacted when you see someone's failure um, at times. And now you've seen Zach Eady and Braden Smith and, and Painter, Coach Painter, take that team as close as possible they possibly can to the mountaintop. And then you, on the flip side, you go to Iowa. They were at the mountaintop. We, you, you and Tony, I were just having a discussion that this is adjacent to as far as Iowa and what they were doing last year when they were defeated by LSU in the national championship game. And yep. then, I mean, look, I know we've thrown all types of flowers and bouquets or whatever. Um, I'm still bewildered. By because then I, when I'm just having this discussion with you, my mind is opened up to th- what I'm thinking about, right? And going along with that, the fact that Caitlin Clark was here last year and LSU defeated that coronation and she did what she did to LSU, she's a vengeful person. And I mean that in the most positive way possible that you like in sports because usually it's difficult to be able to take out a team. Uh, and you're the go-to person, and you 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 do exactly what you're supposed to be. But yeah, J- James, we're here now, um, where these two teams are with the chance to play in the national championship game. And man, for us being a Big Ten country, a Big Ten center podcast, I appreciate. It. I know you appreciate it because we could be sitting here with a a, a a funeral service as far as when it comes to these seasons. And now we're still sitting here talking about there's a chance that these teams can go and play on the last day and perhaps come out of there with a championship banner. And look, I think that you can probably take the Michigan comparisons one step further, frankly, with both of these teams, because we talked extensively about Michigan kind of getting to that mountaintop repeatedly, getting to that college football playoff, thinking they had a realistic shot at winning the title and then getting slapped down by the hand of God, you know, whichever team it ended up being in that given case. And I think that in the case of a team like Purdue, that comparison is especially valid because you saw them have that kind of run to get to the tournament, those kind of expectations to win that championship potentially, and they got slapped down. And so they've been playing with that chip on their shoulder, looking to prove people wrong, looking to prove that they belong in that conversation. And I think you've watched Purdue over the course of the year kind of deal with those expectations and with that baggage and then throughout the NCAA tournament, they've been kind of turning that all on their heads, especially Zach Eady, I think where it's like, look, he's this, you know, otherworldly talented college basketball player. He's this guy that is going to be the two time player of the year. Absolutely a dominant force in this game. But last season, it did not end that way for them and where you thought it was going to be one of those coronation marches turned into a walking nightmare for Purdue. And I think that this season They've been hellbent on kind of proving those critics wrong, silencing those voices and making it back to this point to try to get that elusive brass ring. And I think that that's where the comparison with Michigan football is just so perfect because that was a team that was led by Jim Harbaugh, was crafted by them to get to that point and was consistently falling short. And now Purdue has finally gotten to that point. And it's like, can they beat their Alabama? Can they overcome that mountain and get to that zenith? And I think that 
when you're looking at where Purdue is right now and where they are one game away from getting to that championship game, I think that that journey has been so similar to Michigan's. And I just keep coming back to it in my head of just how identical those paths have seemingly been. Yeah, and I, I, I wasn't with you when you went uh, for the Big Ten football preview and you had the chance to interview everyone that you had to interview. But it makes me think about when I joined this show with you. One of the first questions that we asked any reporter or anybody that was connected to those two schools was how do they come back from those losses? It was how did Iowa, what did Iowa do about losing the national championship game? It was what is Purdue? What was they focused? Did they run away from it or did they face it in right after or during the off season? And we've seen what they did. Um, And I I think people take it for granted, James, um, because this is what Purdue was playing for. And you uh, usually in sports, when we're like, you're playing for the postseason, mm-hmm. it kind of, it kind of infers that you may have let some things slide during the regular season, not in a negative way, but just some losses that you perhaps wouldn't have lost if you weren't, if you were locked into the regular season, but you know, they're a bigger. Picture product. I don't think Purdue did that. I know they had losses this year. I don't, I think they just lost some games. I, I think they had the eye on the prize. And it, it, it was dogmatic and they've gotten all the way there. And it's something it's again, it's something to behold, because I think we thought they can get here. But thinking they can get here and I'm actually doing it and knowing how crazy March Madness can be. And, the, and crazy was still in the back of your mind that that crazy has affected you. You mm-hmm. know, like there's different. There's a difference from there's a difference. If, for instance, if you've ever been in a car, a car accident. Right. And you don't have to be the person to cause the car accident at all. And that's kind of even worse that you're in a car accident you didn't cause. Because when you start driving again, there's that 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 hesitation when you're entering an intersection. You know, there's that kind of it's in the back of your head is kind of what I'm getting to. And that's what Purdue had in the back of their mind is that, yeah, I know we're the better team, but we've been upset by lower seeds. We've been embarrassed, I should say, by lower seeds. And even though we don't think it can happen, we know you can be one of the top seeds and you can get taken out by a lower seed because any team can win on any given day. And I think that one of the lessons we've kind of learned about Purdue is that they not only are going to be able to win games where they're shooting 45% from the three-point arc, but we've also seen them be able to win games ugly as well. And I think that that's a lesson that they're going to be able to carry forward this week. Not to say NC State is, you know, they play an ugly style of basketball or anything like that. But what I mean is that basically anything that you throw at Purdue during this this tournament, they've been able to really kind of, you know, go with the flow and to go with any sort of game that you try to throw at them. And I think that that ultimately has been really beneficial for that Purdue program is they're not a one trick pony. They are not going to try to beat you in one specific way. If the three ball is not falling, they're going to find different ways to get to the basket and to create offense. I think they only made three three pointers in their game against Tennessee and still beat the number two seed in that bracket. And I think that that cannot be overstated as they kind of make those adjustments heading into that game against NC State that we're going to talk about is that Purdue, yeah, it's been the Zach Eady show, but they've also been able to kind of find different ways to win during this tournament too. And so I think that that's been part of that growing process is realizing there's more than one way to kick this pig. There is more than one way to actually be able to achieve what we want to achieve. And I think that kind of psychological growth has had just as much to do with Purdue's success during this tournament, during this season, as anything that they've done in terms of uh, physical maturation, in terms of game plan. I agree, man. But on the flip side of that, you know what else? They also know that, you know, if push comes to shove, we can just give it to the big man and he can carry us to the promised land. Because that's what the last game, that's what the last game was. It was connect versus Edie and everybody else get out the way. Um, And he pulled them through, you know what I'm saying? Like against a guard who could get it from the inside and outside, a guard that could go out there and knock down some threes, he pulled it off. And I, I, I'm saying this because it, it it goes along with your your winning ugly uh, part where, you know what, we we may have a game where Braden Smith is off. And you know what, we'll still able, we're still a good enough team defensively where we can slow down the opposing teams, yep. auxiliary players. So that I think that's comfort, it's particularly when you're this far in and you have a stinker, not in the – in a bad way, but a stake where the, the rest of the roster doesn't ne- necessarily uplift you, but you're still your guy can do it. There's a comfortability uh, aspect that I think you gain uh, when you're in the playoffs and something like that takes place because you know that you can do it either way now. So even if we're out here and it's not going, we can still stay in this game and perhaps pull this game off. 
I am curious, Ken, for your take on this. Aside from Zach Eady, I know we've talked about a lot of different players already in the course of this podcast. Is there any particular Purdue player that you're kind of looking at as maybe being that like secondary uh, primary guy that needs to like kind of step up to help them get across this finish line and get into the championship game? Is there anything that you, anybody you're kind of zeroing in on when it comes to uh, this Purdue Boilermaker squad on Saturday night? Yeah, you snapped at me uh, last episode uh, when I was comparing him to Iowa. Um, How it's dare Smith. you, sir? How <laughs> dare you, et cetera? It's Braden Smith. It's Br- and it's 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 because of who he, he who he is and who he can be. If we just get good, Braden Smith, it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be hard, in my opinion, outside of UConn to beat them. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like for real. I don't. If you if we get good, Braden Smith, I and I know we're, we'll get further into the game. I'm gonna say here, yeah, I got him. All right, I, I got him. And I'll get into my feelings on the matchup when we we into that place. But yeah, it's Braden Smith because of what he can he can do. And I, to be honest, I'm still interested if he's hurt. You know what I'm saying? Now Me maybe too. I'm making an, an excuse, but he he did get hurt in the turn. He got hurt two weeks ago. You know what I'm saying? And he's been playing. Yeah, that he had some lows, but it's you can tweak something so quick on offense and particularly defending because you don't even know what your reaction is going to be when you're responding on the defensive side of the ball. So for me, I just, if he's, if he's good to go, I think it's Braden Smith. You get good break. I mean, people, I don't understand it for God, but do you remember what he was doing through the big 10 tournament, the confidence that he was playing with? Yeah. You know oh, yeah. I'm saying? If, if, if you, if you get back to that, just okay. And I, I know I've said it several times, sag off of me if you want defense sag it particularly in transition if he can be that guy that he was in the tournament it's gonna be hard for teams to be able to knock out Purdue in my opinion James classify what I did is snapping at you man I was merely holding your feet to the fire and asking you to clarify your remarks Ken let's God. not sit here and mischaracterize had, what I'm doing uh, uh, oh if you take if you take that as a diss it wasn't a diss all right <laughs> it's not a diss I'm not I'm not dissing you when I'm saying that or whatever me, it was not a diss I, I have seen the um, I, I've seen it when you're willing to, you know, cut somebody with something if you disagree with something. And I did not feel that that was what happened there. <laughs> I merely felt we were more like fencing, right, where we're kind of like, you know, clashing the sabers okay. a little bit. There's no like going to be blood drawn or anything like that. But you got to stay on your toes, man. That's all that ultimately all that right. came off as me. So. I just, okay. you know, giving you a little bit of the, uh, you know, the back sass back, I suppose there. But <laughs> I think you. that the guy that I really am looking to, and you've definitely mentioned this guy a lot, and that is Fletcher Lawyer. And I think mm-hmm. that I, I didn't really realize, like, I, I know that, like, we kind of get to know these teams over the course of the year. That dude's connections to Purdue run super, super deep. I mean, his uh, grandfather played at Purdue. Uh, his mom used to be an assistant coach with the volleyball team like this. The, it is the family business to achieve great things at Purdue for Fletcher Lawyer. And I know that is not going to be something that's going to be fueling him on the floor when they're playing NC State on Saturday night. But when you look at his role in that offense, like there is really there are a few guys they are going to be able to impact the game the way that he's going to be able to. You know Zach Eady is going to go out and get what he needs to get. You alluded to Braden Smith and talked about how that role of distribution and that role of confidence is kind of key to getting everybody else into positions to succeed. Getting Fletcher Lawyer to succeed and to make three-pointers at the clip that he was able to make them during the regular season, I think it's just going to be such a huge component to all of this because – it's going to allow everything else to really kind of fall into place and really settle in. If he's making three pointers, he makes like three, four shots from beyond the arc. I guarantee you NC state is not going to know what to do. They're more than likely going to get into foul trouble, trying to guard Zach Eady inside to kind of force Purdue to go back to the outside. Like that's just going to throw so much chaos into their game planning. I'm looking at Fletcher lawyer as that guy that if he has a big game, NC State just I, I don't know how you can argue that they even have a shot like I feel like everything else for them falls apart if Purdue is getting that kind of production from the outside and so I love your Braden Smith pick I just didn't want to copy it and so I really was looking at Fletcher Lawyer as another guy that could really have that kind of outsized impact on that game on Saturday night um we, we're a, a positive podcast um but you know what I'll say this too I I, it, I was thinking this past week. And I think it's just because we have a lot of teams that we're watching, but a player at the beginning of the year that we were looking for to take some of that playmaking role off of Braden Smith 
and a factor into that guard play um, was Lance Jones. Mm. And, you know, I, I feel like that we've been hyper focused as we should on Lawyer and Smith. But throughout the year, because he's on, in this pecking order, the fourth fiddle that we haven't necessarily held his feet to the fire with what expectations were going into this season. Right. Um, and I don't, I don't think we've gotten a lot of, particularly the last couple of months, a lot of what we thought we were going to get. And this team is still one of the better teams in the country, but I don't think that we got a lot of what we thought we were going to get um, from Lance Jones during this season. And just, I just wanted to say that before the season was out because it crossed my mind this past week. And I don't think that I would be doing my due diligence for this podcast if I didn't mention it. It is kind of interesting how he like has these moments where he kind of swings back into focus, right? Like kind of, it's like, Hey, by the way, I'm still here. Like mm -hmm. I think of the Northwestern game is a great example of that when Purdue won that game in overtime, or I think back to, I think it was the Wisconsin game that he made like three really key three pointers during that game um, and ended up helping them to that victory. And I think that he's the type of guy that you kind of forget about him at your own peril. I'm going to throw out a comparison for you. And this is dedicated to you where you know that Gabby Marshall is going to clamp down defensively in the third and fourth quarter of games, but she nails a couple of early three pointers like she did during the big 10 tournament. You're reminded of, Oh, she can really hurt you too. Like, Lance Jones kind of has that same vibe to me where he mm -hmm. kind of flies under the radar. And then there are these times where he just springs up and is like, oh, hey, by the way, I'm still here and still very capable of wrecking your day. And so I think that that's a great point that you bring up about Lance Jones and a guy that can really kind of, you know, unheralded, but still can really hurt you. And so maybe he's the guy that ends up coming out in this final four and just be like, oh, you want to you know, focus on Zach Eady. You want to try to limit the perimeter shooting of a Braden Smith. By the way, I'm still here, guys. I can still do some damage. That is a, I think, a very good call out by you about a guy who really could kind of do something unexpected and step up. Yeah, yeah, he he, he can. And and those are the things and those are the players at these particular times that carry you over the hump. Like if we go back really and look at majority of the national champions or teams that made it to the national championship, usually they're going to be. And I love the fact that you mentioned Gabby. They're gonna, there's gonna be that glue player where you're like, man, if they didn't have so and so, mm -hmm. you know, like, and people would have people like, yeah, whatever. No, it's that moment where you like that game was about to get out of hand or go the other way, and that person was like, nope, I'm gonna step in, I'm, I'm, I'm just, or they have an innate ability, you know what I'm saying, to be able to pull that off. So, I that, that's one of the reason I brought up Lance Jones because maybe he is that guy, but we, we need to see it, you know what I'm saying, and this is the time, this is why, this is why you go to Purdue. All right, this is why you're like, yo, I'm gonna go there. All right, portal, here I come. You know, so this yeah. is it, it's time to pull it off. I mean, it, you, if you look at it, just as the two teams, and they're both center dominant teams, right? Sure are. You have you, you have DJ Burns Jr. Um, that we've seen this rip apart the ACC. All yep. right, we were we were talking about him in, inadvertently. Two a month and a half ago, the first matchup between NC State and Duke, with this was around uh, so not too far around the time when Filipkowski Filipkowski had the uh, injury from the play, the the, the yep. student running across him. Right? Yeah. I was talking about how athletic. I was like, man, Filipkowski is really athletic. He housed Filipkowski. Filipkowski is going to be in the lottery. All right, he's probably going to be if he comes out this year. He's in the lottery. All right, he housed him with how thick he is. But man, you and you can do that. But now he's playing against – Zach Eady isn't a beanstalk. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Zach Eady is big. Too. So it's not a situation where you can you can knock yourself or bow that player as easy. And he's 7'4", right? And, and, and DJ's not – vertical isn't renowned. For anybody that doesn't know, all right? It's not – he has a 40-inch vertical. No, 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 that's not – that's not – that's not DJ BJ, all right? Yeah. So, uh, again, just looking at the focus of what you got, the hottest team in the country in, in NC State. Let's just be totally on Hottest team yeah. coming out, one of the toughest basketball conferences in college basketball, all right, the ACC. But now you're, you're focusing on a guy that's as big as you are and a lot taller than you are. So with that, it's going to be a lot of what the guys on the outside can do Particularly, I'm even saying this more for NC State because the only way for me that D 
DJ's really going to be able to exploit Zach Eady, and I don't think he's going to be able to do it consistently, is a way – it's four, five, five feet away from the rim trying to get past him with his agility. But Zach Eady's so long, and DJ's not that fast. I don't think mm-hmm. there's going to be – a, a lot of times where you're like, damn, he just put blew, 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 blew past him and was able to get the ball and lay the ball up without contest, in my opinion. I think that's a really good point by you. And I think that the one other thing I would mention to our listeners, if you maybe haven't watched a lot of NC State games, their ability to contest three pointers is going to be really important too. Um, I looked up a stat uh, before we got started and they completely shut down Marquette when it came to shooting from beyond the arc. They attempted 31 three-pointers in that game against NC State, made four of them. That, that to me, signals that they were taking a lot of contested shots. They were trying to cycle the ball around, were not able to find open looks at the basket. And I think that if they can kind of frustrate Purdue in that area, Zach Eady is going to get his. And I know we've mentioned they have found different ways to kind of get around that. But if you can somehow, like, contain Zach Eady slightly and then you can also get that three-point shooting to go as ice cold as they got it to go in their previous two victories that is going to be a massive mountain for Purdue to try to climb Mm -hmm. over and I think that I'm confident they can do it but that three-point defense that NC State has been able to show in this tournament is something that you really are going to have to pay attention to when it comes to uh, competing against the Boilermakers and so Ken I know that we've ended up got we've got a hard out during this podcast. And so we are going to want to transition over to the women's uh, tournament, the women's final four. I'm going to ask you for your prediction for Purdue and NC state on Saturday night. Um, I think that was really great. What you said about astute, what you said about the three pointers. Um, my only, my only pushback would be what we just saw in the last game. Yeah. Um, but they actually can pull it off. And you pointed out there. But can they do it two times in a row? That's great point. Great point. I I, yeah. I do. I do believe I think Cinderella's slipper is gonna fall off. And Cinderella mm-hmm. being NC State. Um, and I, I know this is an anniversary from 40 years ago from when Dickie B took that team all the way. And then what was that? The play where prior to the national championship game, the sh- the missed shot and the, the, the four grabs it and th- throws it into yep. the, the hoop. Um, and I mean James wasn't even here, and I was like four. Um, but yeah, I'm going with Purdue, uh, James. I think uh, I think Zach, I think Zach Eady can handle this, and it's not a knock to the rest of the players. Um, but I think he is, and uh, you know, and also shout out to him, and, and we knew it was coming him and uh, connect being finalist for the Wooden Award. Heck yeah, man, and well deserved, well mm-hmm. deserved for sure. And so, I think that the one thing I will say about Purdue for this is that. I think there would be almost a temptation to overlook a team based on their seed at times during this tournament. I think that you see that a lot in the first and second rounds. I don't think Purdue is looking past anybody. They haven't to this point. I think that will absolutely continue. Taking that potential weakness off the board, I think they can deal with whatever uh, defense is getting thrown at them by Burns or whether it's the three-point defense that we alluded to. I do think Purdue wins this game. I think it ends up being... Fairly close early on, but I have utmost confidence that team's going to be able to figure things out in the second half of this game. Really pour it on. I got Purdue winning this thing by 15 and potentially setting up a matchup with uh, UConn in the championship game. So that's where I'm kind of heading with that. Uh, same way. Uh, I, I like the fact that you said 15. I do think it's one. You hit it on the head. I think initially the context will it will seem that it's close. And then I think as the game goes on, you're going to see the pedigree of Purdue. I, I honestly do. Absolutely love that. All right, Ken, we're going to get over to the uh, women's side of things. We do have a a Big Ten team in that uh, Final Four as well. You have the Iowa Hawkeyes. They will be going up against the UConn Huskies. Talk about a titanic matchup of teams that have been to the top of the mountain before and have been consistently good in a team like UConn versus a team that has really come onto the scene in the last few years and now is experiencing the swan song of probably the greatest generation collection of student athletes that Iowa has had in any sport over a prolonged period of time. This is their moment. Like this, it, this is make or break time now for Iowa. And I think that they carry that pressure with them into every single game that they play at this time of year. But now you are on the biggest stage that this sport has to offer. And so Ken, I think the very first question that we have to kind of ask ourselves is, and I think that we have seen it over, you know, the elite eight when they literally played in the most watched 
game in women's college basketball history. And now you're at this point, this stage to me does not seem like it is too big for Iowa. And I think that that is, you know, as much as anything, a reason why I'm confident that they can go in there and beat UConn on on uh, Friday night. Man, this is going to be hard. Um, yes, it is. Listen, an assassin saw an assassin and assassin said to assassin, I'll see you on Friday night. Um, Paige Buckers looks at, and this is in my opinion, looks at Caitlin Clark and is like, you're living my life, all right, due to my knee injuries. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, when you think, for anybody that's just coming along to women's basketball, if Paige Buckers doesn't have these knee injuries, everything is the same almost. It may be location may be different with Caitlin being in the middle of the country with a, a school that didn't have the storied history that UConn has when it comes to basketball in general, women and men's. Um, so it's something new is the reason that I'm bringing that up. Um, but you're talking about two assassins here and they can do it in different ways. Some of the, some of the plays that Paige was hitting that last game, four feet in and 10 feet out were like, oh my, that was one handers that, that, that turnaround one hand shot she threw and it looked like she got fouled. Um, she is something, man. And I, it's just, it's, it, it, it you know, I'm all, I'm team Iowa y'all outside of Ohio yeah. state being around. Sorry, <laughs> but this is going to be, this is going to be a matchup. I'll say this, James, I, on the UConn side, I think UConn having the injuries that they've had that's made their ro their roster smaller and having to go deeper into their bench, I don't think that's as much of a weakness compared to a bluter coach team that doesn't go crazy into their bench. You know what I'm saying? Like usually you you're gonna have some myriad of of Gabby, Martin, Caitlin. You know what I'm saying? Out there, of course, with Hannah and the Fluter, there's going to be something, and we'll see, of course, if Molly's able to do anything. Hopefully, even if she just gets to play, it's great for her because we know how what she's meant to this program. Um, but it's just a, this is going to be something different. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, I'll tell you where my heart is leaning. My heart is leaning with Iowa. Being honest, I part of me, I don't know the outcome because you've got one of the best coaches ever in women's basketball in Gina Oriema. Um, and you got a player that in the annals of UConn wants what all the greats of UConn has had. And that's a national championship. Yep. And she doesn't, she, she's still, you can see the hobble in her from the knee injury. She like, she's a killer and she's not a hundred percent is what I'm trying to get to. All right. Like, Oh my, you're doing this and you're just still, Oh, she's old. She's old woman. Logan. All right. Like she's still, <laughs> she still can do get it done. All right. If you get what I'm saying at, a, at the highest of levels, um, I got, I got Iowa winning, um, because I think Iowa can, can pull off a little bit more with the players around Caitlin, but this is going to be hard. Edwards versus Stokey. Um, I may lean towards Edwards. I, yeah. I still, don't, I still don't think coach Bluter exploits, the, the speed of Hannah Stokey as far as just tiring out opposing centers. Um, and I think that needs to be taken advantage of, particularly if you're, if, if we're talking about this game versus Edwards and what we, we think is going to be the national championship game versus Cardosa. Um, but yeah, I'll go Iowa. This is going to be, listen, I'll, let me say this. If Iowa pulls it off, these next two games going to be tight. <laughs> yeah. right? like, this is, this is the creme de la creme. There's no, um, ooh, surprised you're here, people, really, right now. Even if you're talking about after what you thought UConn was after the injuries and surprised that they were able to get here, that's one thing. But they're still UConn with one of the best players and top three players in the country on that roster, Jay. I think that the one thing I'm really keeping an eye on with this game, and it this is not a knock on what you know LSU was able to do throughout the season, but I thought their game plan of – trying to clamp down Caitlin Clark with Haley Van Lith and absolutely not moving away from that during the course of that game, I think really kind of helped set the tone for Caitlin Clark. And I think that when you look at UConn and what they were able to do specifically against USC in the elite eights, they had, they got into some foul trouble during the elite eight. Nick, Nika Mull, I think is how you pronounce her name. I apologize if I messed that up. She drew the task of having to guard Juju Watkins during that game against USC 
And when she got into foul trouble, who was it that came in and was able to really kind of, you know, Page. slow things down and really kind of keep Watkins at bay? It was Beckers, dude. It was Paige Beckers. And she came in that fourth quarter and was able to do that. And I think that that willingness by Gino Ariema and that ability by him to kind of reinforce that defense and to kind of change things up if things aren't working against Caitlin Clark. Like I mentioned, Zach Eady is going to eat. That is going to happen. It's just a matter of how many courses you serve him. I think that's <laughs> the exact same thing that you're kind of looking at with Caitlin Clark. And I think that with UConn, they're going to have that ability and that willingness critically to make that adjustment and not to repeat that mistake. And I think that that's going to be something you're really going to have to keep an eye on during that basketball game is how UConn not only defends her, but how they also change that as the game goes on. And I think that ultimately that's where I think UConn is going to be maybe a step beyond what LSU did. Not saying that'll be enough to win, but definitely adds a wrinkle to the proceedings for sure. That matchup alone, uh, noted Laureate J. Cole said on a, a song about him and Drake that them looking at each other is like the Spider-Man meme. That's Paige and Caitlin. All yeah. right. It's like, and they're not the same player, but this, as far as I will take you out, and that what you said, watching Paige on Juju and Juju on Paige, bringing back 80s basketball, NBA basketball, where mm -hmm. I'm not, we're not talking about, I'm worried about my, my star player getting a foul. I don't want my star player to get a foul. No, no, no. We're not living in that. I'm going to guard you. You're going to guard me. When that happens, James, I'm going to sit there and there will be a grin on my face because I know that the level of play is going to even go to another level right there. But, yeah, I think that that's pretty astute uh, with your, you breaking down what Gino did and how he altered it not to. And it's funny because then you had Kim Mulkey talking about, well, we let we let her get off. We didn't stop her last year referring to Caitlin Clark. You better you better figure out something. You know, all right, I'll tell you that much. You better be able to figure out something. But uh, yeah, man, I got, again, I got Iowa, but I think it's going to be a great matchup. I can't wait for Friday night. I know what I'm doing after a digital epic. So I think what, I, what I'm going to kind of glean from the way we've been talking about this game so far is that the non Caitlin Clark player on Iowa that you think is ultimately going to play the biggest key in this thing is probably going to be Hannah Stolke. Is that a fair assessment of nope. the way you're kind of viewing this I'm, game? I'm, I'm, I'm going team James and going with Kmart. Okay. <laughs> no, that's so, totally I love, look. I yep. love Hannah. I love Hannah. Um, I don't. I think some of it's Hannah. I think some of it's Coach Bluter, and I also think some of it is Caitlin Clark because we see Caitlin will go away from you, all right. Mm. But also, I I think when you talk about when we talk about how excellent of a passer, particularly up court passing, Caitlin Clark is. I just feel like it should be a uh, it, it should be embedded in their game plan because Hannah takes off anyway. Like you, you yeah. one thing you don't have to worry about is the motor on Hannah Stokey. She is taking off. You are going to see opposing teams defender behind her trailing, and when you have a passer with the accuracy of Caitlin Clark, I don't see why they just don't exploit the the easy hoops. And so, if they did that, James, I would say yes. I haven't seen it. And I've been calling for it. So I'm mm -hmm. going with Mark. I'm going with Martin. All right. Like, hey, I'm a ride with the winners, James. You've been winning. So I'm all right. Like, I'm, I'm going I, with Martin, man. What I will say, the the only thing that I would say, like, aside, like, I think that you're exactly right. Like, I think they need to make sure they're emphasizing Stalky's athleticism. I think the officiating in the um, LSU game maybe played a little bit of a part in that. She got into some foul trouble, and I'm wondering if maybe that kind of, you know, lowered her impact slightly. That'd probably be like the only thing I would maybe say with that. But I would also say, to your point, during previous games when she wasn't in foul trouble, you still didn't quite see it as often as perhaps you would have thought. And so I think that you, you're you onto something with that with a very small caveat attached to it. I think my player actually would not be Kate Martin. I will let you get on the Kate Martin bandwagon on this one. I am going to go with another player who's really key defensively and a player that's really kind of shown as she stepped into the starting lineup late in the season and transitioned her skills as a sixth player into the starting role, and that's Sydney Appalter. And I think that she has had a really strong tournament so far. Uh, Lisa Bluter absolutely raved about her during a press availability on Tuesday. Big thank you to Claire Philpy for hopping onto that for us and asking her a question about Sydney. I thought that her classifying her as a blue collar player who brings toughness, versatility, 
and physicality on defense. I think that kind of betrays the game plan that Iowa is ultimately going to have for her in this game against UConn. She's going to be in there to muck it up, and she is going to be in there to not only do what Gabby Marshall is able to do in the closing stages of games, but to be a constant disruptor. And I'm really looking at her to kind of bring that intensity on both sides of the floor and knock down a key shot or two. Mm. I think that if we we already know the main suspects in this. We know the Clarks of the world, the Martins of the world, the Stolkies of the world. We definitely need to know the Appalters of the world too. And I think that she is going to be a really key component to all of this. And like I said, hearing Lisa Bluter talk about her the way that she did really kind of reinforced that to me. And I think really kind of indicates what Iowa may be looking to do with that game plan against the Huskies. She's a Swiss army knife. Um, Heck yeah. Talking about a player coming that was the sixth person and now coming in who hits open perimeter shots, but also is adept at cutting to the basket. Like she knows when to cut. And I, I don't think people appreciate cutting sometimes, you know, because it's just really being heads up and having a high IQ. But sometimes it's like, wait, who was that? Oh, it was a fluter. Right. Like, so like very, <laughs> she is a Swiss, a Swiss arm. And that's a good pickup, James. That's a good pickup. Really unfortunate. It is unfortunate that Molly Davis got injured when she did, but I think that the adding that to the mix has really kind of given Iowa a nice little secret weapon. Uh, Coach Bluter did talk about kind of robbing them of a little bit of depth, with, which I think has been kind of a consistent thing you and I have talked about in terms of like having that ability to go seven, eight players deep. It does rob them of that. I will say on the other side of this coin, UConn isn't exactly the deepest team either. And so both nope. of these teams will have to avoid foul trouble. will have to kind of do some minute management when they can. I think it's going to be really fascinating to see just how like full bore they are throughout that game, knowing that if one of, that one of those teams is going to win, they may have to turn around and face South Carolina on Sunday. And let me assure our listeners of one thing that is not a team that you are going to out depth and out class. That is a team that could roll nine, 10 players deep. They've been doing it throughout the tournament. There is a reason that team is undefeated. And so I'm kind of wondering what the chess game is going to look like in terms of load management. I, I can already guarantee one thing. Caitlin Clark is not coming off that floor unless Lisa Blute her drags her off. Of it. <laughs> so I think outside of her, the, the chess game is going to be absolutely fascinating with this too. Great point. And it makes it, it harkens back to Caitlin talking herself out of getting on the going to the bench when she was in foul trouble. Mm -hmm. and Bluter, Bluter going ahead and as a wise coach would, would do, knowing, OK, my best player is telling me I'm not going to get another foul. Just keep me in the game and went on and won that game. So, yeah, I'm with you. Unless unless Bluter's yanking her off, it's, it's not a question. You're going <laughs> to let Caitlin cook. Even if it's like a 15 point game, I think Caitlin Clark's going to be like, nah, I'm good. I'm going yep. to stay out here and I'm going to do my thing. We're so, going to make sure. We're going to make sure. <laughs> you, you have definitely um, uh, kind of betrayed your thoughts on the game. I do share with you, by the way, the expectation Iowa is going to win. This game is going to be so tight, dude. It's going to be, I think it's going to be very similar to the LSU game where it's going to have that like that prize fight feel to it. And I am so looking forward to it. I think that Iowa wins. It's going to be a single digit game. Only a couple of points spread. I'm not thinking Caitlin Clark is going to go as full beast mode as she did against LSU, but I do think her supporting cast is going to come through with flying colors, and I am also going to pick Iowa to win a very tightly contested game. I had a Stokey but not getting foul trouble. Yeah, absolutely, man. Your your uh, your favorite Iowan better keep you know mm -hmm. keep things together, keep her composure in that game. Because UConn can put pressure on you and force you to do that. It's very similar to what Purdue can do with Zach Eady. Like that just consistent pressure ultimately gets you into foul trouble and ultimately limits your options. And I do think that UConn, the way that they are consistently pressing, that could be an issue for, for sure for Iowa that they will have to deal with. So, yeah, Ken, like these are two games that we think that the Big Ten teams are going to win, setting up potentially titanic championship matchups. I really hope that we get what we are kind of hoping for with a Purdue UConn final on the men's side and an Iowa South Carolina final on the women's side. I don't think the NCAA could have drawn up better matchups than we could have with those those championship games. But 
got to take care of business in that semifinal first. Great point. Like right, this is all the eyes on whatever platforms these games are on. Um, this is the matchups it's, it, right now, but particularly the championship games. If you sit there and you have UConn versus Purdue, right? Like those two big time schools, number one seeds. And then you have Caitlin Clark versus Don Staley, South Carolina team. Yep. All right. That's what you, they, we wanted this last year. All right. We thought Aaliyah Boston was going to be in this, this, this dance. And yep. now you, you've getting it this year. So yeah, this is what people have been wanting for. And it, it seems like that this, this train is, is heading to that direction, James. We absolutely cannot wait to bring you all of the breakdown of these games and hopefully fingers crossed guys, previews of national championship games later on this week. Ken, Great tidy podcast today. We got this thing licked in 40 minutes. I think that we have we've accomplished something good here on the Big Ten Country podcast. Any final messages for our listeners before we head out? Nope, just be safe. I don't think I really got it. I, my actually, my final message, I already used it up, and that was with Connect and with Zach E.D. being Wood, Woodson uh, finalists. So I have nothing, James, unfortunately. You know what? That's totally fine. We will let this podcast speak for itself. That's a really stupid choice of words, but I'm going to let it live. Y'all have a great week. and We'll talk to you after the semifinal games on the Big Ten Country podcast. Congrats. You finished the video. If you want to build on that success, download the NBC Sports Chicago app. It's got highlights, exclusive insights, and push alerts tailored to you. Everything you need to be a real Chicago sports fan. Download it now.